Hi folks, welcome back. Thank you for watching. Please do hit subscribe if you haven't done so yet. It really does help when you do that. So today folks, welcome to the final end of month Q&A video for 2022. And as you'll be able to tell, I'm not at home at the moment. So I'm going to have to shoot and edit this video somewhat on the fly. So apologies if the audio isn't quite as polished today as it usually would be. I'm gonna to have to edit it on my laptop, not my iMac at home. So the graphics might look a little bit different, but I'm going to do my best. And I should also say that yesterday I managed to score myself some very nice but quite cheap pajamas in the Boxing Day sales. And they're so comfortable, I'm not taking them off. So I appreciate that today I look like some sort of Scottish Teletubby, but they're very comfortable and it kind of fits with the sort of in front of the Christmas tree type vibe anyway. So we're just gonna roll with that, no regrets there. Now there's been slightly less videos in December, but some really big ones. And I've got loads of your comments to get through here. And if you remember back to last month's uh, Q&A video, you will have seen that I was getting very frustrated with the, the new YouTube kind of at handle things they're using, because rather than showing me your name, it gives me just a random string of numbers and letters in some cases. That seems to be here to stay, unfortunately. So I'm gonna try and read out your names when it's obvious, but I can't always do that because YouTube doesn't tell me what your name is anymore, which is really irritating. But anyway, let's get into your questions. So first up this month, David Sanderson. Hi Joe, if you're replacing the pickups in the Barn Buster, what are you going to do with the Bill Lawrence micro coils? They sounded great. They do sound great, they're wonderful pickups. The replacement pickups for the Barn Buster still haven't arrived. They, there was a quite a substantial waiting list for them, which has turned out to be even longer than I was initially quoted, but fingers crossed, January, February time, they should almost certainly be here. The, the Bill Lawrence micro coils, I'm certainly not getting rid of them. My old um, Mexican telly that I kind of refinished and converted into an Esquire, I might change that back to a two pickup Telestar guitar and put them in there. I don't want to get rid of them because they do sound absolutely phenomenal. I just want to experiment with the Barn Buster with some traditional Tele pickups and see if I prefer them. And at the end of the day, if I don't prefer the new pickups, the Bill Lawrence pickups are going straight back in the Barn Buster. So you definitely haven't seen the last of them, let's put it like that. F Golding. I bought the Sunkeeper after your original review and I'm super happy with it, especially the overdriven sound. Other pedals that I've bought have come and gone, but the Sunkeeper is definitely a keeper. The Effectrode Sunkeeper is one of my favorite overdrive pedals I've ever played. It's a two channel pedal, um, two 12AX7 tubes in running at proper high voltage, based around the orange Mark I Rockverb type circuitry absolutely phenomenal sounding thing. Now we're gonna go on later to talk about the massive uh, 2023 pedal board build video that's going out at midnight tonight. Um, the Sunkeeper isn't on the board, but that's not because I don't love the Sunkeeper. It's only because I have my orange Retro 50 head and I kind of prefer the Pix only thing over the Rockverb thing. And if I want a cranked orange sound, I've tended to use the amplifier. So it's a little bit surplus to requirements to have that pedal just kind of on my pedal board and build the board around that massive pedal. So, um, but please don't take that as any slight on the Sunkeeper. It is a stunning pedal. This amp is absolutely incredible. This is my Marshall 2061 lead and bass 20 clone that I scored on eBay a few months back. Joe, you have to do the video showing all of your guitars, but you also have to do a video showing all of your amps because I've lost count of what you have. Um, I will do that video on the guitars at least, um, fairly early in the new year, I think. I'll probably do the my five most special guitars and talk you through them because it's a video I've kind of put off making because it's not really about the gear, it's about my gear and what I've bought and it always feels a bit uncomfortable to do that but you keep asking for it so I'm going to put it together for you. In terms of amps, um, amps come and go a lot more than guitars do. So amps that you've seen on the channel previously, I might not still own them. I quite off, I have quite a turnover of amps, will sell off old ones, buy new secondhand clones usually. Um, so various things you've seen on the channel previously might not feature in that video because I've probably sold them. But maybe I'll do something on amps in the new year too. I'll um, see how the mood takes me. Dirt Creature 1. I'm still trying to decide between the A30 and the A60 for my Magnetone Varsity Reverb. 
It's a 15 watt and I put a cream Alnico in it, but I've been wanting to try a lower wattage speaker like the A30 or 60. The amp only has treble and bass and volume, so I've been wanting something a bit brighter. Amp seems to have a lot of lows even with the bass down. Yeah, the Alnico Cream might be a little overpowered for a 15 watt amp. The Alnico Cream's a great speaker, but you need to push it to really make it work. It'll only be ticking over at 15 watts. Um, as you have quite a thick sounding amp and you want more bite, I would definitely go with the A30 because this is a very loose rule of thumb. It doesn't apply to everything, but usually the lower wattage of the speaker, the brighter and thinner it is. And the higher wattage is the thicker and the more rolled off up top it is. And the A30 definitely has more top end snap and bite and treble than the A60. I love the A60, it's a killer speaker, but for what you're wanting, something's gonna tighten up the lows and give you a bit more bite definitely look at the A30. The A30 is one of my favourite speakers and we'll go on to talk about that a little bit more in a second because I'm now using it in my main recording cab. It's that good. David Dorian 5349. Dr. Z is the only amp brand I need in my life now. I have the Z-Rec head and matching cab and a Z-Best cab. The amp is just ridiculous. I'm now keeping an eye out for a Dr. Z antidote to go with my Z-Best cab and also looking for a red 210 Z cab and a red Stangray head to go with. Just insane amps, never heard slash played anything like them. Sounds like you've got quite a Dr. Z shopping list there, so hopefully uh, Santa might have bought you at least one. Um, yeah, Dr. Z, some of the finest amps out there. He's just an insanely talented builder and designer. Now, the Dr. Z amps, they're not cheap, especially when they're in the UK and they have to be imported. But once you actually look inside one, you can kind of see why. Everything in there is as good as it can possibly be. The output transformers, the capacitors, the wiring, even the chassis, the way it's, the cabs are constructed, everything is just as good as it can possibly be. So yes, you could absolutely go the rest of your life only playing Dr. Z amps, at least I could. They are stunning things. I've uh, been looking recently at their Marshall, um, I think it's the EMS, where you kind of have a, I think it's a JTM50, a JMP something, and a JCM800 switchable in one head and you can choose between tube and solid state rectification that thing looks insane i'd love to give that a go at some point but yes i cannot recommend dr z amps highly enough this is crucial to get right or since tone circuits and audio processing devices don't exist not really the point of the video if i'm honest yes you can brighten the pickup up or darken it using an eq pedal or anything else we were kind of looking at whether humbucker covers make a difference to the sound in that video. So if you're not looking for kind of nerdy forensic videos, you are definitely on the wrong channel. Jerry Macklow, referring to your initial chat, a guitar can be art or a tool. It can also be a capital investment. If the latter, it might as well be a lump of metal or a carved rock. It has ceased to practically be guitar. A guitar as art is okay. Many are beautiful, but it will be the tool guitar that you want to play. Personalizing your tools is eminently reasonable. Anything that increases the usability or your enjoyment of the guitar is to be encouraged, except if the instrument has genuine historical value. Now, this was a comment underneath last month's Q&A because I was talking about some fairly fired up comments on my Rickenbacker video and there seems to be a real kind of group of, sort of Rickenbacker enthusiasts who will say that anything that isn't genuine Rickenbacker makes the guitar invalid and worthless and you've destroyed it well done you and I really don't think that's to be the that is the case as Jerry doesn't think either because I took the stock genuine Rickenbacker high gain pickups out of my 330 and replaced them with some vintage correct premium quality hand wound toaster pickups made by a boutique manufacturer, not Rickenbacker. And the fact that those pickups don't have an R on them and cost twice as much as what I paid means I've destroyed my guitar. Really don't agree with that. I think you can absolutely customize your guitar to get more enjoyment out of it and make it more to your personal tastes. Why wouldn't you do that? And yes, if you've got a 1959 Les Paul, you're not gonna stick a bare knuckle nail bomb in it. But when you just have a normal guitar that's your guitar and a real workhorse, if you want it to sound brighter or darker or change the voice of it or change the pots or the wiring, 
go for it. It's your guitar. Enjoy it. Make it to your personal tastes. I don't understand why anybody wouldn't do that purely because the new stuff might not have the manufacturer's logo on it and therefore it's not valid as an instrument anymore. Really not true, I don't think. Uh, right. One of the coolest looking tellies I have ever seen. Great tone. And this goes on to the biggest video of the month, which was when I took my old, fairly tired, Japanese-made 52 telly to Matt Gleason at Monty's Guitars in Cheltenham. And he majorly modded it, and uh, it now has some of his brand new wide-range humbuckers in it. We tentatively called it the 50 Lux, because it's a real mashup of 52 specs and the Fender Deluxe specs. The Tele Deluxe specs, sorry. So we called it the 50 Lux, um, and it's just a ridiculous sounding guitar. We've got a fair few questions and comments about that guitar here. Morton Wilson, absolutely excellent. A real treat sitting in with Matt and seeing how he brought your original concept to fruition with such impeccable taste. Congrats and look forward to hearing more when you're settled in with it. Sounding pretty good straight out of the box. Now I have dialed that guitar in to really suit me and in all honesty, I only made one change which is raising the neck pickup by half a screw turn. That was it. Everything Matt did and how he set it just works. I've experimented going either side on pickup heights and all that sort of stuff. He pretty much nailed it, just setting it arbitrarily and going, that's where I would start. Have fun. And yeah, I raised the neck pickup a little bit because it improved the middle sort of split pickup sound. And the split sound on the wide ranges is probably one of my favorite sounds in that entire guitar. It's really, really great. And just nudging the neck pickup around kind of changed that to be more suited to as I liked it. And it also balanced the pickups out in terms of bridge and neck a little bit more too. So it really didn't take much dialing in and I absolutely adore those pickups. They are really, really special. This was a really interesting video. I always wondered why people like those humbuckers, but that is because a long time ago I butchered a guitar to fit one of those and it didn't sound good. I was not aware at the time that it needed one meg pots. Your guitar sounds really good. It doesn't need one meg pots, it's just that when Fender first introduced them in 71, 72, they used one meg pots with them. So if you've heard an original wide range Tele Deluxe or Thin Line and you liked how that sounded, it was probably with one meg pots. But they'll work absolutely fine with 500k pots. It's all personal preference. But as I said in that video, when I'm starting out with a guitar I tend to gravitate towards the vintage specs or the first iteration specs of that particular model live with it for a bit and if I think it could be more to my taste I will then start to tweak but the one meg pot with those pickups just really work they absolutely scream Ian Johnston really enjoyed that looking forward to the in-depth review when you become better acquainted with your new setup I hope this won't be the last of your Joe and Matt slash Monty's adventures I really hope it's not the last video too. I really don't think it will be because working with Matt was an absolute dream. He is like hyper nerd. And if you're someone that feels a bit embarrassed about how obsessive you can get over fuzz face transistors and capacitor values and things, go and talk to Matt. He'll talk to you for hours about it. He is as nerdy as the rest of us, like more so probably. And he knows everything there is to know about building and setting up a guitar properly. He's an absolute genius. And he's only, he's pretty close to me, he's less than an hour drive from where I live. He used to be in London, he's now in Cheltenham and that's much closer to me. And actually where I am today, I think he's only about 20 minutes up the road. So he's, it's really easy to get to Matt. And one thing I want to do in the new year is get more of my guitars professionally set up. Because I can do a, a fair amount of setting up with intonation and relief in the neck and all of that. But I could not believe with the telly how much of a difference a properly set up guitar makes in terms of how it feels to play and how easy it is to play. Having a properly cut nut that intonates well around the sort of first position, having the action and the relief set properly and all of that, it made such a huge difference. So I want to get more of my guitars properly set up in the new year and I think I'll only ever go to Matt for that and having worked with him because he's just the best, he really is. Monkey brains. Surprised you went for a swimming pool route. Future mod, possibly. Very interested what you think of those Evo frets. I'm considering them or a stainless in my Les Paul. Um, I don't think that guitar could be any more modded from what it was a few weeks ago. So I don't think there's going to be any future mods on that guitar. Um, in terms of the swimming pool route, I had quite a few comments about the fact that Matt routed out 
a sort of quite a large cavity underneath the pickguard rather than individual cavities for the two pickups. A um, couple of things about that swimming pool route is firstly it's very common especially with fenders to find that in production fender guitars because it means they can make one body and they can configure it in various different ways. So if they route out the middle of the guitar they can then take a pick guard that's loaded with traditional Strat single coils for example or an HSS Strat or humbuckers or P90s or whatever they can just load the pick guard and drop it into any body and it will fit. If you route the body for just traditional Strat single coils and then want to put a P90 in it you can't, you have to reroute it and it's a pain in the backside. So the swimming pool rack is actually very common to find in production fenders. It's not out of the ordinary whatsoever. The other reason we did that, or Matt did that, it was also a time consideration because to route out cavities the right size for wide range humbuckers, he was going to have to um, make a custom routing jig and that was going to take a long time. And as you will have seen in that video, he worked on that guitar from like 10 in the morning until 10 at night solidly. And it was getting really late by the time we were routing the guitar. And so there was a time consideration that as well. But a few people were quite upset with the fact that a big hole was routing the guitar. It's not a problem at all. It's completely covered over. You never see it. It's common for Fender guitars anyway. Really doesn't make any difference, I don't think. Bandit Sharp. The most compelling 50 minutes of viewing I've had in years. Brilliant. Great to see firsthand what's achievable with a bit of imagination know-how and of course a few pop. I'm from an engineering slash joinery background but would be scared to death of tinkering with a guitar to this extent. This luthier is a pure genius. Big respect. Absolutely agree. I have a quick question though which I hope you can answer. I was curious when Matt routed out such a big chamber for the two pickups. I imagine two individual smaller chambers would have been cut out. The amount of material removed was substantial, however by doing this he created a whacking great hollow chamber. Now as the resonance is in the type and mass of wood, was Matt taking away too much of a good thing? Conversely by creating a sizable chamber did this benefit, tone and sustain, compensate for the loss of mass from the body? I'd be interested to hear your theory on this, Joe. Cheers. In all honesty, I don't really have a theory on it, but what I can tell you is that guitar now sustains better than it ever did. Now, I cannot give you a sort of before and after comparison with what difference the route made, because of course the guitar is now completely different to as it started out. Different pickups, the bridge has been chopped down, it's got different frets, different action, every single thing that could change, changed. So I can't say how much of a difference it did or didn't make, but it sounds phenomenal, it sustains brilliantly, and as I said, we called it the 50 Lux because it's a mashup of a 52 and a Fender Tele Deluxe. The other guitar that had the wide range humbuckers in back in the 70s was the Telecaster Thin Line. So the fact it now has a cavity inside it makes it almost a little bit more like the Thin Line. So it kind of worked, as I said, it was a time consideration too. It would have worked just as well routing out individual pockets, but it certainly hasn't affected the guitar in any detrimental way whatsoever. It sounds wonderful. Might be a tiny bit lighter by taking some of the wood out. That's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. It's just a fact. But yeah, there is nothing kind of wrong with doing a swimming pool route. It's perfectly functional, sounds great, you never see it because it's covered over, and yes, it has a cavity that will resonate and it hasn't affected the sustain anyway. So for me, it's a win all round, I think. This is a really nice guitar. Weird question, but what do you think about wide ranges doing metal? I haven't seen almost anyone doing it. Interesting question, and in the pedal board build video going out at midnight tonight, I used this guitar for the entire demo because it just sounded great. And I used some heavier gain sounds in that video, so you might want to check that out. I think the wide ranges could work really well for metal because they do have a real punch to them. One thing I would say about them is, especially with the one meg pots, they do have quite a bright top end. So for real super heavy gain saturated sounds, you might want to roll the tone down a little bit or maybe use 500k pots or whatever. Um, the other thing is the Montes pickups are, they're not fully wax potted, which is good. I don't particularly like wax potted pickups. I think they're very sort of quickly and lightly dipped just to kind of hold the coils in place, but they're not sort of saturated to the core. So with crazy high gain, you will get a bit of microphonic feedback. So you might want to have your pickup modded and extra wax potted if you're wanting to use it with a lot of gain. 
but they sound great with high gain. And I'm not a metal player, but I would imagine they could sound great too. There's a real kind of punch and clarity and sizzle to them, which I love, and that will sound great with metal, I think. Great and awesome demo review video ever seen in YouTube. Thanks, I think. By the way, would you please tell us all the knob settings for the sound of SRV, how to get it dialed in? So this is the crazy tube circuits crossfire, which is a tube screamer stacked into a black face fender amp in the box type circuit. And no, I can't tell you the sound to get the SRV sound, but that's only because it will sound completely different with different guitars and what amp you're running it into, or are you using an IR, or all that sort of stuff. So yes, the Tube Screamer stacked into a kind of low blackface type overdrive will get you certainly ballpark. You will have to then tweak around everything else. How you sound as a player, the sound under your fingers, the guitar you're using, what sort of pickups, are you rolling the volume back? Are you going to into a Fender amp or a Marshall amp or a Fox amp or all of that? It will sound hugely different into Every, every single thing in your rig will make a difference to how that pedal sounds. So I can't tell you how to get an SRV sound out of it. You're gonna have to kind of experiment for yourself and tweak the knobs until that sound comes out in your rig. So there is no correct answer to that. It depends on a huge amount of variables. Michael Gazda. I bought an A30 on Joe's recommendation. Slightly terrifying to me for an AC15 style combo amp and it is mega. One of the best sounding speakers I've heard. It smoothed out any ice pick highs whilst keeping that wonderful chime. I'd buy this speaker again and again. There's a distributor in the USA who you can find on Reverb. Now the A30 has quickly become one of my favorite speakers I've ever played. And I've got my main demo cap that I use for pretty much all my videos, a Zilla Studio Pro. And for years I've had the Celestian Gold paired with a Scumback S75 PVC. The Scumback's now gone and the A30 is in there. And the Gold and the A30 together are just magical. The A30 is such a good speaker. So it doesn't surprise me that you've tried one out and you're absolutely loving it because I adore the thing too. Frantisca. Great tone. What is the maximum output with these two speakers wired in parallel? Is it the sum of the two speakers output or an average between both? Now this gets into kind of wiring a 2x12 but the basic answer to the question is if you have two speakers in your 2x12 wired in parallel basically the power that comes from your amp into the cab will be divided equally between the two assuming the speakers are the same impedance which they should be. And therefore the limiting factor in terms of how much power your cab can handle is the wattage of the lowest powered speaker. So in that example, I had the Fane A60 and the Celestian Gold. A60 is a 60 watt speaker, the Gold is a 50 watt speaker. So the limiting speaker there is going to be the Gold because it's the lowest wattage. So if you divide the input by two, the maximum that value can be is 50 watts. Therefore, that cabinet can be used safely with a maximum of a 100 watt amplifier. So hopefully that makes sense. 100 watts comes out the amp into the cab, it's split into two, so 50 and 50, and the gold can handle a maximum of 50 watts. So that is the limiting factor. If you had two A60s in there, that's two 60 watt, amp, uh, 60 watt speakers, then the limiting factor is 60 watts, and therefore you could use a 120 watt amp with two A60s. 120 divided down by two to 60, and then both speakers are at their limit. So yes, it's the lim it's the lowest wattage speaker is the limiting factor. In a two by 12, if they're wired in parallel, you take the amp and divide it by two, and that has to be below the power of the lowest powered speaker. I'm not sure I've worded that in any way that makes sense, but um, fingers crossed it uh, comes across okay. Alec Boys, the A30 sounds like what the Celestian Ruby should have sounded like. And this is probably my favorite comment on this video because I could not agree more. Now, the Celestian Ruby, as you will have seen in my other videos, is a very differently voiced speaker to any other Alnico speaker I've ever played. Alnico speakers are typically known for their top end chime. They're kind of slightly scoopy EQ. Ceramics are more pokey in the mids. 
Alnico's are more scooped in the mids. They're sort of thicker and brighter with a slightly more relaxed mid-range. Whereas the Ruby has no top end on it whatsoever. It honestly sounds like so muffled it's unreal. And it's just a very differently voiced speaker. So I appreciate and respect that Celestian tried something different with the Ruby. But I think it would have suited more people if it did sound like the A30. So I really did agree with this comment. The, the Ruby is, is good for certain things. If you're after the thick, creamy Brian May type thing with an AC30, happy days. It sounds great for that. But if you like bright, clarity, definition, chime, all the things you would typically use an Alnico speaker for, it's not in my top 10 of Alnico speakers I would use for that job basically, but uh, the A30 certainly is. Have you tried the 280k pot in a telly? Yes, and they are brilliant. I use the uh, VI pots, which are, they're primarily 550k pots with a central lab taper for Gibson guitars, but they also make 280k pots for Fenders. So they are 10% overvalued, and that extra 10% really does make a difference. It just opens up the top end on any guitar, and just lets it really sparkle. You can darken it up with the tone control if you want to, but having that top end there, it, I love it so much. And I use the VI Pots 500, 550Ks and 280Ks in pretty much all of my guitars that use typical pot values. Now a difference will of course be the one megs in my 50 Lux Tele, they don't make one meg pots. And if you want a 100K pot or something like that, you'll have to go a different direction. But for 500 and 250K pots, I love the VI pots and the 280s sound wonderful in a telly. Dougal Mather. Great video. Do you know any more about the differences between the Romani Plus and the 12? I had no idea they differed. Now, I've actually recently sold my Cornell Romani, but I had the Plus, which was the, the earlier model, and that was rebranded to the 12 not long after I bought mine. From what I understand, and double check on the Cornell website with this, I believe that there was two differences between them. They're fundamentally identical amps, but the Cornell Romani 12, the later version, has a three-band EQ, treble, middle, and bass. My earlier version only had treble and bass, so it kind of pivoted around the mid-range. And also, I think the power scaling is a little bit different. My amp had three levels of attenuation, 10 watts, five watts, and I think about half a watt. The Cornell Romani 12 has four stages. I've got no idea what they are. I'm assuming 10, five, one and a quarter or something like that. But yes, it has a slightly different power scaling setup and a third band on the EQ. But otherwise, I believe they are identical amplifiers. Spokes 28. So other than the fact that magnets are numbered two, three, four, and five, what is the difference between them? The material they're made of, or perhaps the strength of the magnetization or something else. So this is the video I made on different Alnico magnets in PAF style humbuckers. And basically Alnico stands for aluminium, nickel, and cobalt. And the different numbers of magnets are different ratios of those ingredients going into the recipe. So an Alco 5 will have a different ratio of aluminium, nickel and cobalt to an Alco 2. It's how the metals are kind of mixed together. That gives different magnetic properties, different strengths and ultimately different tones. And I could be wrong on this. I'm sure someone will correct me in the comments if I am. I believe Alnico 3 doesn't have any cobalt in it. So technically it's an Alni magnet rather than Alnico. Um, but yes, it's just the different ratios that give different magnetic strengths and tonal properties, ultimately. But they're all basically made of exactly the same thing. Yeah, Aaron Souter. Yay, finally, I've been waiting for your demo and checking it, for, checking for it every day this month. Love you, Perky. So Aaron has been um, politely reminding me for the last few months that I said I was going to demo the Williams Audio 1.5 Tone Bender, and it took me a little while to get around to it. So I'm very happy that I've finally been able to uh, give you a, an early Christmas present, Aaron, and uh, demo that pedal. And it's a wonderful pedal at that. But um, yes, thank you for sticking with me, Aaron. I'm, uh, I got there in the end. The Cantrell Project. I love all of Nick's benders. In fact, I have them all, never selling them. 
And now that I've got the 1.5, I've got all of Nick's Tone Benders too. And I think early in the new year, I will do a revised version of the Williams Audio Tone Benders compared video I shot a few years ago and include the 1.5. So I'll have the Mark 1, 1.5, 2, and 3 Tone Benders, put them side by side and see how they differ or are similar and all of that. So I think that should be a lot of fun. But uh, Nick makes, I think, some of the absolute finest Tone Bender replicas out there definitely rival the originals. Now, this comment really made me smile. And it was it's kind of a comment in two parts because they replied to their original comment. It's the reply that just tickled me. Why are we all so obsessed with pedals? It's like crack for me. And then the reply, I'm not gonna read it out, but it just made me howl when it came in. So thank you for leaving that. It really did kind of entertain me over the Christmas period. Verone 26 would anyone know which side of the King of Tone is based on the Blues Breaker? Both of them. Uh, the King of Tone is basically two identical pedals in one enclosure. The only thing that makes it sound different is where you set the internal dip switches because you can configure each side to either be a boost, an overdrive or a distortion. So depending on where you set the dip switches, the sides will sound different. You have the treble trim pot inside so you can make one side glassy and the other side darker and also when you order it if you get the high gain mod on one side or the other or both that will subtly change the gain but ultimately they are two identical circuits in one enclosure so they are both based on a fairly modified version of the old Marshall Blues Breaker circuit. Ariana Arena Patchy. I'm going to give up with these tags now. They're so hard to read. Well done, Joe. Great content and a likeable personality. Winning combination, mate. Merry Christmas. Well, thank you for the kind words. And this was a real milestone that we hit together just before Christmas, which is we finally hit 10,000 subscribers on this channel, which considering a few years ago, I was like reaching a thousand was my like massive goal and was really hoping I'd get there by a certain point in time. To now have 10,000 of you watching this channel is absolutely mind blowing. And this channel is not Thing without you folks it takes hours and hours and hours and hours to make each video and it's really hard work doing it but when it goes live and your comments come in and we can chat in the comment section that is the fun bit of this channel engaging with you guys so I know I say at the end of every video please do subscribe it makes a huge difference. It all helps with the YouTube algorithm and that boring side of things. But uh, yeah, it's great to have so many of you here and 10,000, it really was an early Christmas present. It's a massive milestone for a, a tiny channel who is usually in their bedroom. So it's, um, it's great to see the channel growing in this way and fingers crossed it continues. Wayne Graham, Joe Perkins with a G. I have tried various Blues Breaker clone pedals, but I can't find one that will give, get, can get those Clapton Cream Women tones and those 1962 Blues Breaker amplifier tones he used for the Cream albums that has that tube breaking up tones. Which pedals can get those woman tones? Um, two things there. Firstly, the woman tone is largely about your tone control on your guitar, rolling the tone right down and making it go really sort of nasal and dark and honky. That's the first element of the woman tone. But the second answer is, Bear in mind that the sounds on that album were a screaming JTM 45 combo with KT66 tubes and tube rectification through presumably Alnico speakers with a 1959, I think, uh, Gibson Les Paul standard with PAF pickups, which I think were uncovered by that point in time. You had Eric Clapton playing that guitar. It was screaming loud in a room with tons of bleed from other microphones because everyone set up and played live. It was going through a recording console, getting tracked to tape. It will have been mixed and mastered. All the, There are so many factors to that Clapton woman tone thing that you can't just click on a pedal and get it. It's never going to happen. And as I said earlier about the Crossfire, the Crazy Tube Circuits pedal, a pedal will sound hugely different with a different guitar going into a different amp or different software or whatever. So it's not possible to just have your guitar and your fingers and your style of playing and click a pedal and go, oh, there we go, it's Eric. It doesn't work like that, it really doesn't. So yes, you can get a Marshall in a box type pedal by based on like the JTM45, something like the Wampler Plexi Drive or the Kings, uh, not Kingsley, the well Kingsley Constable, or the Keeley, is the word I was looking for, the 1962X pedal with the KT66 mode. 
it will get you a little bit closer, but there are so many things at play that it's not a case of turning the pedal on and there's Clapton. It can never work like that. And by far and away, the biggest factor in all of that is the player. You're not Eric Clapton with Eric's fingers and Eric's touch and feel on the guitar. So you can't just turn the pedal on and get that sound. It unfortunately doesn't work like that. But a JTM 45 type pedal will get you a little bit closer. And finally this month, Peeve. Happy New Year, Perky, and Happy New Year to you all, if that's not too cheesy a way to end a video. It's been a great year on this channel, it's grown hugely, and as I just said, it's you folks being here and engaging and commenting. That's what makes the hours that go into every single video worthwhile. So it's been, we've had some really good content, there's some great stuff planned for next year. There will be a new guitar on the channel fairly soon. It's really frustrating because it was delivered home this morning, and I'm not at home, so I can't even meet the thing until Monday, Tuesday next week. Really annoying. With a new guitar, I've been talking to some different manufacturers, we've got some videos planned for the new year, which are gonna be great. I really want to get out and do some more interviews and chat to pedal builders and luthiers and things. Because working with Matt at Monty's a couple of weeks ago, it was just so much fun being on location and I was just kind of filming him doing this work and sharing his knowledge with you guys. And it was just so good doing that when I spend most of my life sat in a bedroom talking to a camera myself. So I want to do some more of that. And of course, at midnight tonight, we have the massive pedal board build video. It's a really long one. I think it's like an hour and seven minutes long or something. Um, I've put tags in the YouTube slider bar, like the timestamp things, so you can flick through it and you don't have to watch the whole thing if you don't want to, because it is long and it is, you know, very in-depth. But I've gone all out this year. Maybe I could give you a little sneak peek of the board now, maybe? I'll put the picture on screen now of a little bit of the board so you can get an idea of the scale of insanity that I've gone with this year. But watch out at midnight. It's, it's a good video. I'm it was, could not be happier with the sounds in that video. There's a bit of playing I did at the start, which was from, actually from a different take of the main video. And I kind of put it at the start with a sort of comic graphic over it. It's one of my favorite recorded guitar sounds I've ever heard, let alone one that I've had a part in recording and playing. It's just, I, I could not be happy with it. So watch out for that at midnight. But I think that's about it, folks. So thank you so much for a great year on this channel and I cannot wait to see what next year is going to bring. So uh, definitely check out the pedal board build at midnight. So it's usually the biggest video of the year and it's a huge amount of fun putting it all together. It's an absolute ball lake trying to make it all work and sound good, but when you actually get there and you're really happy with it, it's hugely rewarding. So check out that video. I hope you all had great holidays and great New Year's tonight. Some of you, when you're watching this, will just about be into the New Year, I think. So um, I hope you all uh, have a good party or whatever you're all doing, and I will see you very, very soon. Bye-bye.